Hi, I'm Dr. Raj Sundar, a family physician and a community organizer. You're listening to Healthcare for Humans, the show dedicated to educating you on how to care for culturally diverse communities so you can be a better healer. This is about everything that you wish you knew to really care for the person in front of you, not just a body system. Let's learn together. Welcome to part two of our conversation with Fernanda. If you missed part one, give it a listen when you can. This episode continues the discussion of the challenges of mental health accessibility, focusing specifically on the value of drop-in services in breaking down barriers. As we talked about before, it is all about approachability and how to make mental health more approachable. And then we build on it to talk about inclusivity. For example, do you know what it looks like to tackle the unique issues faced by youth in the Latino community? It's not just one-on-one therapy and medication like it ever was. It's about all those non-clinical approaches like workshops, book clubs, and community programs. What seems like straightforward approach that speaks volumes in making the change that we see. And lastly, this discussion doesn't shy away from sensitive topics like machismo and topics like the LGBTQ plus identity in a religious and faith-based community. Fernandez, Grace, and Navigating These Conversations offers a fresh perspective on how to approach all of these topics. Here we go. Let's continue with Fernanda for more real talk on what mental health means. I, oh, I wanted to call out the drop-in part of it because I think sometimes we're so rigid with systems that you need an appointment to get a care you need. In so many cultures, this accessibility of having a walk-in or drop-in basis is so important um, because their life is chaotic and there's just so many things going on to change your entire life and your responsibilities to come to this one appointment. Yeah, no, and especially for a working family, it's hard. It's difficult now. Drop-ins is more, let's just get this going. And then we're going to do the appointments, right? But I feel like the drop-ins, that's like the first step when you are in that moment and you're like okay i really need to talk to some i want that to be available be like okay let me just let me go there and then on saturdays or sundays we are usually like at a like at a mexican built business like either a restaurant or a store and they see it and they're like oh let me just go ask them a question about it so i feel like that's really important to at least get that going that flexibility yeah you're just the number of i'll say interventions which is a very clinical word that you're talking about is so much more expensive than just one-on-one consultations, which we acknowledge is important specifically one-on-one with therapists, but there's just so many other ways of connecting with folks to build that rapport and address this distrust that many people have with large healthcare systems and health services. Yeah. We also even do uh, like drop-in hours on Tuesdays. I think there's two hours that we do either testing or coming into the office for students, for youth and young adults. And it's usually more students, usually like first gen, gen students. And just having a, a place where we're all first gen, like our parents didn't go to college. We had to navigate that ourselves. And just having that, I think that's been really good. What are the obstacles that you're going through? We get it. We did it. We had to navigate the college system. We know the guilt of we're breaking that first circle. It's okay. I'm not staying here to take care of mom and dad because that's usually what we've been taught. And that is a big guilt. That's something that we have to learn how to navigate, how to deal with it. A lot of these college students that we work with, they are like the breadwinners of the family. And they're under extremely a lot of pressure financially, academically, personally, to not being able to go home for the weekend or literally leaving your home with young adults. Yeah, and we, people talk about youth mental health a lot these days. Is there anything else that you would call out that approaching mental health for specifically the youth, Latino population, when how has it been more accessible or more supportive in the ways that you've thought about approaching it? It's like almost the same type of approach that we have. Where it's like, we have the same struggles, right? We have some college students that have access, like our drop-in hours or 
they come to our workshops around mental health. We have a workshop on gender and sexuality as well. And just how to get that conversation going, providing a safe space. Because even though on campus there's mental health, they always say they just don't understand. They talk about boundaries and how I need to have all these boundaries with my parents. I can't do that. I mean, I can't, I'm not there yet. So just having that conversation around, we get it. We understand. So it's almost like the same approach. It's very casual, not clinical. Let's talk about it. What do you want to talk about it? And, and there's different ways to do it. It doesn't have to be a session of peer, peer counseling and things like that. Because I know college students are youth and young adults. They, they have more energy. There's other things that we could do with them that they want to do. We have a book club that is centered around LGBTQ characters. So it's a safe space. And we read the book. We come together. We discuss it. It's fun. We relate a lot to the books, to the characters. So it's just something unique and different. Our culture events, a lot of students are volunteering our culture events. So that way they feel like a sense of belonging. They're home away from home. So that's like the work that we do with youth and around mental health. We have a ballet folklorico. We've had college students start ballet folklorico. Yeah, they spread the word. Next thing you know, we have seven college girls to ballet folklorico. And just connecting them with our other students that they probably wouldn't have met because they were just so busy in their four walls of college. But getting them out of that and getting them to be more connected in, in the community through culture events, that is mental health. You know what I mean? That, that helps them be more social. Yeah. But not. Because loneliness and social isolation is one part of it. So it seems like you're building community with each other and with others across generations too. I think we seldom get that opportunity these days. And then like the other cultural activity that we briefly launched was a soccer youth program that is completely free. I don't like to use too much of the word academy because it's more than that. You know what I mean? One, one thing is soccer in our culture is so big. It's part of our culture. It's not a sport. It's not just a sport how it is here. And soccer is so expensive in the U.S. So a lot of students, a lot of youth were not being able to access proper soccer, being, joining clubs because it was expensive and some of the parents couldn't afford it. So then we launched this program with two professional soccer coaches. We, we were like, I hope this works and let's see how many families we get. It was amazing. We had a great turnout. A lot of parents came. Students were excited. The youth were excited. Those are things when I talk to like funders, they always think, no, no, we can't do clubs. I'm like, we, it's not a club. It's a minute you realize that it's not a sport to us, then you understand the importance of it. Yeah. And that's part of looking back to what you mean of it's not enough just to have a bilingual person and say, oh, we can address or support the mental health of the community. That example of boundaries is such a concrete example of, yeah, but you used to talk about boundaries with so many people, but it doesn't work for us, right? Because we have big families, we're connected, and what does that really mean? And you want somebody that really understands that. Or this example of soccer, hey, it's more than just a sport. And it's so important and builds so many other things. Yeah, exactly. The next part that I wanted to touch on, Fernanda, thanks for sticking with me this long, is how do you help support smaller communities within the bigger community, right? And I, what I mean by that is that I hear about the sense of machismo a lot. So how does that affect the mental health and well-being of women, Latina specifically, or people's acceptance of the LGBTQ plus community within the larger Latino community and of feeling like they're not accepted or families not accepting the sense that their child is expressing them themselves in a way that they don't fully understand? How, what does that look like to you to uh, help support that in the complexity of the <laughs> Latino culture? Starting with LGBTQ, we have these gender and sexuality workshops once a month. And the goal of that is that anyone who has questions, who wants to learn more about it, can come to those workshops. They're in Spanish and ask those questions. What does it mean to my child said non-binary. What is that? And sometimes we have one person comes in. Sometimes we have five, six people that come in. So I think it's so important that we 
have that available. And I think a lot of times, especially like with nonprofits, like we're so scared of not showing big numbers, right? We apply for the grant. And I think some of these grantors, they want, okay, I need you to touch base to 500 people in your contract. Yeah, sure. I can do that. If that's all you want me to do, you just want me to do the outreach. I can give out 500 flyers. I can put it on Facebook and reach a lot of people. I don't think they understand. That's not what's going to change. That's not going to do much. Yes, we need that. But guess what? Of those 500, maybe we'll get five. And if you can start with those five people and provide that service, that education, that is five families. And and that builds that community. That conversation starts going. I want to say that I'm seeing more support from parents around the topics of LGBTQ. Yes, there are still some that are conservative in the sense like the religion doesn't allow them to really dive into it and, and really explore that and find out. But we've had some folks that are Catholic and they want to come in and learn about it. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of places that want to touch base around that, maybe even the stigma, it's not only like religion. I don't think a lot of people understand that religion is culture as well. So I'm not a practicing Catholic. I don't go to church. But if you ask me, I I consider myself Catholic. And it's so engraved in my culture and how I was raised that it brings comfort to me. I don't agree a lot with the institute of the church itself. But I have my faith. So I think it's so important that we don't attack people. I don't want to attack people and be like, no, your religion is wrong because it doesn't let you love people. It's your own personal belief, how you feel. And we can't change you, how you feel. But what we can do is educate. That is your thoughts, your feelings. It's not mine. It's not your neighbors. Just like mine are not yours. We have in our sexuality and and gender courses or workshops, we have folks that they bring up like, oh, God, and it's okay. Yeah, God does love us all. Jesus does love us all. It's okay that that's what they want to bring because that is their faith. That is their culture. And they love their kids more than anything. I think that we can't be too aggressive. and, And we need to understand that religion can be part of our culture. The, the machismo part, I think it's, again, the same conversation. It, very interesting. What is machismo exactly? I think often people think that in Mexican cultures, usually like men that run the house or men are like the head of the house, but it's actually not true. It, women are the head of the house. Honestly, run everything through Abuelita. She <laughs> makes the decision. They are the core of the family. They make the decisions. So that's not really what machismo is. I think people think machismo in Mexican cultures, it's men are the head of the household. I'm like, no, it, it's grandma. <laughs> grandma is someone that ruled the house, basically. But I think for me, machismo is just, it's like the patriarchy, right? If I had to recap what you're talking about, I mean, when we first talked about the LGBTQ plus community, one point that resonated with me is how when you're supporting the youth is actually educating their parents and making that in an accessible way. But on top of that, you're not being confrontational with families' existing beliefs, which people maybe dismiss as religion, but it's actually a part of life. And that's important to acknowledge. And I think it's harder to do when you're outside the community because it's so easy to challenge something like religion if you're not religious or you don't believe in God. You're like, why are you letting that get in way of this? person trying to express themselves and that goes back to you talking about how people who are familiar with it addressing it in a way that brings both perspectives in ultimately because people love their children and you're going to keep anchoring on to that as you educate folks and build acceptance in this community and maybe similarly with the machismo understanding it clearly and then understanding what work needs to be done Again, it's easier if it's done by the folks in the community, like you said, all the work that you all are doing, thinking about it and what it means to address it, because it's complicated. And I think we sometimes make it two-dimensional, as you noted. I think people's understanding of machismo is that 
hey, in the Latino culture, men are the head of the household and they're causing a lot of harm when you're like, no, that's not actually it. It's uh, maybe a, a sense of expressing this masculinity, which is deeper uh, in our society itself. Does that recap make, give it justice? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's how it is. It's to be much just a little bit not being able to show emotions, right? Feelings. We have a common saying, like, los hombres no lloran, like, men don't cry. Yeah, they do cry. You know, we all cry. <laughs> We're all human. I think having that conversation more, and that goes back to mental health. Let's talk about your feelings. And sometimes they don't want to talk about it, like, men don't feelings. Let's get that conversation going there as a society more than within the household. Because other things that happen when they say, oh, there's domestic violence, yeah, there's the domestic violence, and that's another topic to talk about. But it's more than just machismo. There's a lot more things going on when it happens to domestic violence, and that's a bigger, broader issue that it yeah. needs its own podcast in itself. I know. I think we attribute it to machismo when it could be an expression of generational trauma and current life suffering, exactly. financial insecurity, or people are suffering and they're expressing their anger in a way that's obviously harming another person, but it's so complex. Yeah, exactly. Okay. The only other thing that I probably wanted to bring up was this idea of generational trauma. I think, Fernanda, you mentioned it yourself, like family trauma too, of what it means mm -hmm. to support people through that. And it may be similar to everything that you've noted making it accessible, making it easy, and then taking it step by step through that journey. But I don't know if there's anything else specific or special to that idea, which it's just so hard sometimes to support people through. Yeah, there's different ways or different avenues of generation trauma. Are you talking about within my generations and my family? Is it like the history of social work practice? in the U.S., you know what I mean, with BIPOC communities. And I think that's a, a big one here. I think a lot of people can relate when I say I and my sisters were my parents' social workers growing up. We were my parents' interpreters, medical interpreters. We were my parents' bookkeepers. And we witnessed how bad society was to our parents, mm -hmm. where it's not an event, even going back and, and thinking when I was in elementary. Like the way I could tell they had no respect for my parents. I mean, not all, I'm just, but some, there are a few teachers here and there. So obviously, when I told my mom that I was going to be a social worker, she just looked at me like, okay, like, what are you going to do? Take away babies? And that's something. Wow. Like, no, yeah. That's not all we yeah. do. Yeah. Oh my God. You know what I mean? Yeah. But to them, it's just, it's that fear. It's, we were basically, we were threatened all the time by they're calling CPS. You know what I mean? And it, it works different in BIPOC communities, right? So if I go to a, a, a household and there's 10 Mexicans in that household, grandma, grandpa, cousin, that's how I grew up. So it's like, that's fine. You don't understand multi-generational homes. We live like that. We care for our elders. But if it would have been like someone else, or if I think about when I was taught at school, oh, we have to have a deeper assessment. Is a child safe? Can a child really be in a household that there's 10, 12 adults? Like, that's not healthy. Yeah, there was always that fear that social workers were just not understanding. And that is why also they didn't want to seek any help here in the U.S. when it comes to that, because it was such a wide approach to it. So getting that conversation going, and the same with the doctors, there's so much information they would withhold because they were afraid, who are they going to call? Are they going to call the cops on me? Are they going to call the social workers? And that was a bad thing. It's sad, but that was a bad thing. And they're going to call the social worker, and the social worker is going to come and take the, um, my kids away. There's a lot of work and healing to be done around that. And then there's internally in, in households, I think back and I'm like, man, I had some really dark thoughts when I was a little kid. And thank God that I did good. But that's why it's so important to start talking about it and start seeing those symptoms. Is your child recognizing those symptoms of like depression? Because I think I look back and I'm like, I don't think this just happened out of nowhere. I think I've had depression my whole life. Definitely. But we never knew what that was. You know what I mean? Like, well, we, parents didn't know what that was. So, yeah, I think that's just 
there's a lot of work to be done internally and within society. Yeah. Awareness is so important. Thank you so much. So the last question that I always ask uh, people on this show is about last time you were at a clinician or healthcare system, whoever who cared for you. And it was done in a really well caring, kind way that they acknowledged their identity, your culture, and what you were going through. Or the flip side of when it really was dismissed and you want to tell people of how not to do things, either of those. Um, so like recently I so I was in the hospital over the week for my son because of his medical condition. And one thing is he's not a big baby anymore. So when the physician came she was talking to me, but she was also talking to Nathan. So to me, that really made me happy because they didn't just see my kid as a disabled person who can't speak and talk or it's not there. And I think a lot of times people are just, even if you're in the medical profession, I think a lot of times people either don't know how to engage with people with disabilities or are afraid or not sure what it is. And they just, they tend to ignore them. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that, Fernanda. And thank you so much for coming on the show. I think people will learn a lot from what it means to support people's mental health, especially in the Latino community. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks again, everyone, for joining me on another episode, Healthcare for Humans. If you liked this episode, as always, my ask to you is please share it with one other person and go to healthcareforhumans.org to sign up to be part of the community. And lastly, thank you to Tessa Chu for supporting this podcast, making sure it's the best it can be, and helping with the creation and the production of all parts of this podcast. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.